Welcome back. Uh, this is Dr. Ron Prefer from Western New England University. We've been talking about in the previous three tutorials about um, acids and bases, and I'd like to just like sort of wrap that part up before going on to the calculations of why this whole thing is important. So, the acid base in nature influence a lot of things about the drugs. Um, not just its chemistry, but its um, pharmacology, its therapeutic benefits. Um, if a functional group is ionized in a certain pH, its water solubility increases. And that, think about that. If, if we have a carboxylic acid with an H off on it, versus a carboxylic acid with the H off, so minus, which one's going to be more water soluble? The one with the minus, because it's sort of like a salt, sodium chloride. Actually, it's even an incorrect way I said it's not sort of like a salt. It is a salt. If it's an ionized species, it is a salt, and therefore increases water solubility. And therefore, we sometimes formulate drugs that way. We make into the salt form to increase the water solubility. Or we tweak the molecule to make it more or less water soluble because we, we're having uh, difficulty crossing various uh, membranes in the body. Um, we need this to be solubilized so that it can actually get into the GI tract. So the unionized form, the non-ionized non form is not as water soluble. However, we need to be non-charged, unneutral, in order to cross the lipid bilayer. So you need to have a molecule that is just on that border, has that right, what well, turns out to be called log P value. Um, um, partition coefficients, ability to be lipophilic and not lipophilic at the same time. And how we can do that is because if we use these weak acids and weak bases, opposed to strong acids and strong bases, they can, they are there's an equilibrium whether or not it's ionized or not ionized. And therefore, if it's ionized, this allows for functional groups to form electrostatic interactions. And not only we're talking about getting into your gut and into your small intestines and crossing your BBB, you know, and, you know crossing uh, cell walls, the lipid bilayers, and creating to the BBB, all these things matter. But you also have to understand that you have a the molecule has a role. This you've designed this drug to do something, and most likely it's it's designed to target some overactive protein or underactive protein. So you need to find a molecule that binds to that protein. Well, how does a molecule bind to a protein? Well, there's the van der Waals forces, hydrogen bonding, but by far the strongest of those are electrostatic. So ionized or unionized. So if you have a molecule that has a, so a protein that has a binding pocket, and in there are some plus, there's arginines and stuff like that, you want to bind to it. Well, you want to make sure your molecule, that you're, the drug that you've designed, has a carboxylic acid, a tetrazole, a sulfonamide, some kind of negative nature so it can electrostatically interact with that pocket it is the strongest of the non-covalent forces so that's how it gets in there so drug molecules need to have this in addition drug molecules can interact with the plasma proteins that circulate around your body and that can actually sequester a drug um, and, and then and therefore prevent its elimination to I mean, enhance its duration of action. Be more specific, human serum albumin. That is a huge major transporter of drug molecules. But it's not really specific. But it generally binds acidic drug molecules more than it does with the basic ones. And it forms hydrophobic and it can also drive sorry, it can also bind hydrophobic compounds more tightly than hydrophilic. So, the question you have to ask yourself, well, what if you're taking um, combi therapy, or not even combi therapy, just some, a patient of yours has, is on more than one type of medication, and they both happen to have a negative uh, acidic function group. It could be totally different. One could be a carboxylic acid, the other drug contains a um, sulfurea. Totally different. But, what could happen if you took one, and then a few minutes later you took the other? Well, you have what's called plasma protein displacement interactions, meaning the first one could prevent the second one from interacting with it, causing the half-life of the second one to be short. Or the second one can knock out the first one that's being held by the plasma, causing that duration to be action to be uh, in, uh, in, uh, sorry, decreased. 
or all of a sudden we're flooded with a huge amount of the drug in, the, in your bloodstream. This can greatly affect the half-life of drugs, because sometimes drugs are 90% plasma bound. Let's look at some well-known plasma albumin bound um, drugs that happen to have acidic moiety. You got warfarin, which is an anticoagulant. You got the NSAID, so um, pretty well aspirin as a prodrug, and you have phenylbarbital, an anticonvulsant. Well, this uh, the, here we have a classic carboxylic acid. Here we have an imid, and here we happen to have that beta dicarbonyl hidden in the enol form. So they're all acids. They all have acidic um, function groups, therefore they all have a pK value that range depending on the type of functional group they have. Okay, but what if you were hypothetically going to take a warfarin with an antibiotic? Here's an antibiotic here. What would happen if you took them simultaneously? Well, well, truthfully, what actually happens is bleeding. But the question is why? Well, you actually end up having your, uh, your bloodstream flooded with warfarin because the antibiotic here, this acidic antibiotic binds to albumin more, t bind or more tightly, displacing any warfarin. So all of a sudden you have a huge amount of warfarin in our bloodstream. So what I'm trying to get at is understanding the function groups, whether it's acidic or basic, is crucial. But remember, albumin is likes the uh, hydrophobics, but they also like acidic function groups. On the opposite end, you have your alpha-1, uh, uh, sorry, alpha, Jeff, stop there. On the opposite end, you have your alpha-1 acid glycoproteins. These tend to like to bind to basic functional groups, so drugs that contain a basic functional group. So here we have, we have the um, antihypertensive, there's a secondary amine, here's a tertiary amine, here's a secondary amine, lidocaine. So again, you have yourself proteins that transport molecules throughout the body, that are specific to acids and bases. So if you take combi therapy, you can have some interactions that are unwanted. Well, most interactions are, but some uh, significant side effects. And it all comes down to whether it's an acid or a base. So it's not just calculations and knowing it's an acid or base. Here's some real interaction that can harm your patient. As I mentioned, drug molecules that are highly ionized are more water soluble because how more highly ionized they are salts. <clears throat> so if they're more water soluble, what, what what effect will that have? Well, it tends to be metabolized less and therefore it has a shorter half life. Because what is the purpose of any of the metabolism? Whenever you take a molecule and your body metabolizes, which we'll get into in different types of metabolism, what's the whole purpose? It's to make that molecule more water soluble, more water soluble, so you can excrete it through your urine. If a molecule is already very water soluble, then your body doesn't really have to do that, and it's going to be excreted via your urine. So this is a fault, we'll say, of a um, medicinal chemist to design a molecule that's not very water soluble, that is very water soluble or too water soluble. However, sometimes you want a drug that has a short half life. If you want a drug with a short half life, then you want to make it water soluble. But there actually are specific proteins tr that um, are selective to organic acids <coughs> within your renal tubule and your kidney, and they actually excrete the acidic molecules from the plasma to the urine. And what, what that happens is you have a decrease of your half-life of your drug molecule, of the drug molecule, exactly as I mentioned. However, the opposite does occur at the same time. There are proteins that put it from the uh, from the renal tubule. In, so from your urine into your plasma, and this will increase the half-life. So again, like it's not black and white, however, it all comes back down to what was the functional group that you started with. As I already indicated briefly, functional groups, I can, if it's an acid or a base, I'm a medicinal chemist. I can convert it to a salt if I want to. Why would I do that? Well, it depends on the salt. I can either make an organic or an inorganic salt. If I want to make it, say, um, an a inorganic salt up top here, it's much more water-soluble. 
quicker duration of action, quicker onset of action. If I want to make an organic salt, well, it's, not, it's much more lipophilic. I could take an intramuscular injection and therefore it slowly releases just by messing around with what type of salt it is. And in order to do that, I need to know that whether it was an acid, in this case an acid here, there's your um, almost like a salt, it's a sulfonamide bordering on sulfoyurea, and here's a carboxylic acid. Inorganic salts enhance water solubility, whereas the organic salts typically um, end up um, enhancing the lipid solubility. And this is a great way for, to formulate um, suspensions for intramuscular injections. Uh, these lipid soluble um, salts are slowly released and end up having a longer duration of action. And oh, this is very, very important to remember. Acids and bases should never be mixed in an IV. And it's, this is way back from high school chemistry. An acid and base equals salt and water. Now, this the salt and water is not always the case, but the salt part is. So if you have an acid and a base, two drugs, and you're injecting into the IV, they, there's a high probability that they will form a crystalline molecule, which could either clog up the actual IV, or actually crystallize within the veins of your patient or your arteries. So be very, very knowledgeable about what the what you're administering, obviously, but understanding why you should not mix two um, molecules together. Finally, we, one thing we've also been able to do is um, utilize this acid-base chemistry with bile acid sequestrants. Um, for those who are um, understanding a cardiovascular disease, um, high cholesterol levels, well, one way to ensure that um, your cholesterol levels are, are well, you, the amount of cholesterol you absorb out of your uh, dietary food is minimized is um, sequester the bile acids. And so it's an acid, so therefore I add a base to it. I make sure the base cannot be absorbed into my small intestine, so I do a this sort of like a polymer that's uh, non-degradable. And what it does is it, it acts as exactly like I said what could happen in the IV, an acid and a base. So my base happens to be my uh, bile acid sequestrant, and it reacts with your, uh, um, <coughs> uh, with the um, bile acids in the acid-base chemistry, and therefore it sequesters them, therefore it cannot do its job. And this will be wonderful in preventing more cholesterol from being absorbed from your um, the food that you eat. However, and this is the however, you must not take this within minutes or hours if you're taking a drug that happens to have an acid. Um, they've, they've shown to have some very strong interaction with acidic drugs, in addition to some other ones, some base ones, uh, the allols, and even some vitamins. So be aware that bile acid sequestrants, although may be beneficial for your patient, they may ultimately have some strong drug-drug interactions, so be wary of it. But again, I'm just trying to point out, this all comes back down to acid-base chemistry. Here we have what these happen to look like, the three most common bile acid sequestrants. This one here is plus. Therefore, all it wants is something that's negative, and carboxylic acid and physiological pH, hopefully at this point you already figured out, will be negative. So um, that concludes the first four parts. Um, you should be seeing in a little while part five, which will talk more about the actual math around it.